So on today, we are so grateful for all of you being here. As you may recall, last Sunday, we talked about the candles being lit on behalf of peace, on behalf of hope, on behalf of love, on behalf of joy. And uh, we're going to light these candles uh, as a response to the sermon and invite all of us to collectively uh, stand in the gap for our uh, community members all across the world who are at this moment in time living in war zones, living under the uh, oppression of uh, wicked, abusive governments. Uh, we are going to remind ourselves that we are not a people who are unfamiliar with these kinds of struggles, for this is, in many respects, our struggle as well. Uh, and so today is uh, the third Sunday of Advent in the schedule in the calendar today's focus will be joy last Sunday's was peace the Sunday before uh, was hope next Sunday will be love and so I'm going to invite uh, Pastor Nisha can you just give me one of those lighters that work that that one works in Jesus name huh, touch your neighbor <laughs> so we are lighting this candle for peace, and we are lighting this candle today for joy. And with that, turn with me in your Bibles, if you have Bibles or if you're going to follow on the screen, to Psalms chapter 126. This is uh, the lectionary passage for us on today, and it reminds us, it gives to us an opportunity to ask ourselves particularly, what does it mean to live in between spaces that are characterized by grief and spaces that are characterized by hope? Uh, as I reminded us last week, uh, there are so many spaces and places across the world today, particularly in what is deemed the Holy Land, that are canceling Christmas, literally, because it is not safe for them to gather. Uh, it is a space and a time where uh, people's homes and lives are being uh, turned upside down because of the violence and the hopelessness and the militarism that has run amok in the world. And so, you know, I did suggest last week, I took an informal poll while I was preaching, what would it be for us to cancel Christmas here? And uh, just like now, it got real quiet and people gave us a resounding silence. No one said, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. We're canceling Christmas. Everybody was starting to figure out what does that mean. And so we're certainly going to invite us to keep thinking about what does it mean for us to have a different kind of Christmas season? What does it mean for us as followers of Jesus who are conscious of the ways in which we are being formed after the ways of this baby who is born into the world? as a gift to the world, that is it a contradiction to proclaim that we are serving the Prince of Peace and we are so easily given to war and violence? Is it a contradiction for us who are followers of Jesus to claim that he came to set the captive free and yet we are so committed to captivity? that we are a people who know that we ought to be characterized by love and peace, and yet we are easily seduced by the forces of fear, both real and imaginary. And so this passage of scripture is, I think for you and I, an invitation into the psalmist. The Psalms is a, a collection of prayers, of songs that were saying that were uh, quoted, that were recited, 
when the children of Israel were literally making their sojourn, their journey, <clears throat> as many times they had to head to the temple, they would recite these songs and they would be reminded of these prayers. They would pray these prayers over and over and over again. I think it's a blessing that we are a part of a community of prayers that have been prayed over and over again. Can anybody just think about them prayers that your big mama and them prayed? Them prayers that your grandpa and them prayed? Prayers that literally are still sustaining us today. I want you to appreciate that we are the answers to somebody's prayers. Somebody was in a hellish situation 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago, and they said, God, if you can just sustain me through this, my grandchildren, I know they will have a better sense of opportunity. Lord, have mercy. Some of us are dealing with some of that right now. We are praying prayers for our children. I wish I could talk to somebody today. I mean, this is what it means to hope against hope. This is what it means to literally be a person moved by the commands and the demands of peace and joy and love. And so this passage of scripture, Psalms 126, uh, I love how one of our mentors says that that there are times where you have scriptures that are uh, 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 theology in search of an experience, where you start with a particular description and then experience follows that. But then you have experiences in search of theology. Well, you're going through something, and it's, it, it, ain't, it, ain't, it ain't exhausted by the doctrines and the theologies that you've learned, and you got to literally go through it in order for it to make some meaning. Well, this is one of these such passages. These are words that are in search of God's activity. And I want to suggest to you that as we stand in the midst of the rubble of world events of our own personal lives, of national significance, that there is still a promise that has been given to us from God that ought to at least cause us to have a sense of expectation that trouble ain't going to last always. Amen. Psalms 126, this is the word of the Lord. It reads, read along with me, that when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Verse number four is a powerful verse. So restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. And those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right. Yes, yes, yes. So we're going to just talk about living in the in-between of both tears and joy. How can we live in the in-between of both tears and joy? Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. God, we say thank you, Lord. For the word of God that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. We thank you, God, that you've given us your word so we can grow and so we can be formed and shaped after the ways that please you. And I pray today that these ways, God, in this season of Christmas, of Advent, God, will indeed form us after the ways of hope after the ways 
of peace, after the ways of joy, after the ways of love. Bless me as I preach your word. Hide me behind your cross. Send your anointing that makes the preaching and teaching easy. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. Tears and joy. As Pastor Tanisha has already alluded to in our, our intercessory prayer moment, the holidays often provide a fascinating dissonance for many of us who are in tune with the depth and intricacies and nuances of our emotional terrains. Man, you know, there was a time where we didn't even acknowledge this complexity in church. You know, just like, oh, you know, it's Christmas and everybody, joy to the world. And you just like, you just move on through. And people, (laughs) you know, were left in their own isolation of the ways in which holidays or significant days leave us often living in between both celebration and grief. We often are forced to cherish the time we have with those we love while also being bombarded by the feelings of loss that flood our sensibilities without an invitation. Anybody ever had grief and loss just kick your door down and you didn't even ask for it? You just sitting there thinking, I'm over this thing, right? At least I ain't going to be breaking down. And then all of a sudden, you broke down. Amen. I've experienced that a few times this year with the loss of my pastor. Amen. Just think of moments and birthdays and holidays. You usually together, and then all of a sudden, you realize, man, pastor's not here. And then all of a sudden, you get a little teary-eyed and emotional and feel like you need to do something to try to dry all that up. Well, I got to keep moving. But what if, beloved, there was a gift of tears that we ought to at least explore if we are going to, in this season, have the meaningful experience of joy as well? One of the most profound lessons we learn from creation is that Very few things created in the natural state go to waste. I mean, we in our current society have made a great skill in throwing things and people away. We are a culture that is mastered the art of disposability. And we cut things off way too quick without giving that thing an opportunity to have a recyclable benefit. I mean, you know, I don't, I'm, you know, obviously I'm Bay Area guy from California, so there are many things I've taken for granted. One such thing is recycle bins. I'll go to certain parts of the country, and you know, I, there was a time where I didn't care about recycling. It's like, you know, just there's a trash can, all right, everything's going in there. From the rooter to the tutor, right? From the, the, the can to the forks, you know. Now, you know, I go certain places, and I will go out my way looking for an aluminum recycle bin. I'm talking about walking around a store, walking past trash cans. Because I've been formed over 48 years. It took a while, but amen, I got there. That some of this stuff is worth recycling. Well, can you think of the experiences in your life that you can acknowledge that perhaps Although it's been hard and although it's difficult, there are some things that God can redeem. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. There's some things that have happened in your life that God knows how to recycle. And I'm not going to like try to read everybody's mind and situation and try to call out what your thing is. 
I know a few of you, so I could just, you know, act like I'm deep and spooky and pull your thing out and wow the crowd. <laughs> I, I don't believe in doing that. So I say amen. So I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just talk about something that's common to all of us. Tears. Isn't it interesting that tears are things that all of us have, that all of us shed, that all of us are often not very comfortable with displaying, especially if you're a dude. You know, brothers, you know, start tearing up and it's, you know, you making noises and you, you know, you lean back and, you know, throw your head, you know, it's like, oh, you know, it's turn around is, you know, come on, brother, say amen, right? You, you ain't one of these crying dudes, right? <laughs> He's like, my father says, come on, son, suck it up. I don't want to be around no crying man. <laughs> That's what we was told growing up, right? Man, dudes walking down the street crying, you probably get knocked upside your head in the neighborhood I grew up in, right? But tears, all of us have them. And I was doing some study uh, on this uh, several years ago. Uh, uh, Rose Lynn Fisher from the Smithsonian Museum created uh, this powerful exhibit of photography called the Topog of Photography. And her exhibit was called The Topography of Tears. And Fisher collected, examined, and photographed more than 100 tears from herself and a handful of other volunteers, including a newborn baby. Now, scientifically, I'm going to take us to a little science class, because, you know, you can't talk about recyclable things without talking about a process. Tears are divided into three different types based on their origin. You have tears of grief and joy, which are described as psychic tears. You have tears that are triggered by extreme emotions, whether they be positive or negative. So the psychic tears. Then you have basal tears, B-A-S-A-L, tears that are released continuously in tiny quantities in your eyes to keep your cornea lubricated. And then you have reflexive tears, tears that are secreted in response to an irritant like dust, onions, or tear gas. Three kinds of tears. Psychic tears, basal tears, and reflexive tears. And all of these tears contain a variety of biological substances, oils, antibodies, and enzymes. And when you put these tears under a microscope, you start to see fascinating contours of our tears. I, I got an I gotta image. I, I'm going to invite you to put that image up. Because this is an example of tears. Tears put under a microscope. This is at the Smithsonian. It, it, it ain't nothing no, Pastor Mike did. I tested it. But the Smithsonian, I assume most things in the Smithsonian ain't lying. Most things. Somebody say amen. But what is so fascinating about these tears? right, is that after looking at hundreds of dry tears, Dr. Fisher began to see that tears resemble large-scale landscapes, or as she calls them, aerial views of emotional terrain. This is going to help somebody because it's already helping me, and I, I done read this 10 times. Don't you think it's amazing how the patterns of nature seem to show up all in and throughout our lives, whether we are aware of it or not, that God seems to have some kind of process working at the microscopic level far beyond our own 
capacity to understand. I mean, I look at this, this studying of tears, uh, and it makes me think about uh, the tears of grief and joy. The tears of lubricating to make sure my eyes keep working. The tears that are literally about an invasion into my senses. That the scripture says that God will wipe every tear. <laughs> that within each one of your tears, there's a story that God is literally embedded in the terrains of our tears. This is why the gift of Christmas is so powerful to we who follow Jesus is because we do believe that Jesus came and inhabited the humanity, the created order, and out of God's incarnate ability sprung new life. Woo. Can you imagine how God is seeking to go through the contours of our tears and ensure that we are never stuck in a place where God is always wanting to redeem? I love, I love, I love uh, th this quote. I, I, I'm going to read it. Uh, I, I think I got it up there. It, it says that, that, that uh, tears are the medium of our most primal language. In moments as unrelenting as death, as basic as hunger, and as complex as a rite of passage, it's, though, it's as though each one of our tears carries a microcosm of the collective human experience. Like one drop of an ocean. And this is my favorite part. Whenever you find tears in your eyes, would you listen to this now? Especially unexpected tears, it is well to pay the closest attention, for they are not only telling you something about the secret of who you are, but more often than not, God is speaking to you through them of the mystery of where you have come from. And is summoning you to wear, listen, if your soul is to be saved, where you should go next. Somebody say tears and joy. Say it again, tears and joy. And I want you to know, beloved, that there's something powerful about appreciating that tears may be the Step before you get to meaningful joy. That tears may be a stepping stone to you discovering another part of the virtue of joy that is never diminished and that is never reduced and that is never erased. That the joy of the Lord is my strength and yet there are moments that the tears I cry are God's prompting me to remain human in the face of inhumanity. Whew. To remain tender in places where hardness seems to be the only prescribed way through. To remain generous in a world that tells me I have to operate out of scarcity. Tears are often the litmus test for some of us to ensure that we have not become that which we've hated. And this is why you and I must be a people who are never allowing the external circumstances to cause us to ignore the process of God's activity among us. Tears and joy help you and I remain human and divine. Tears remind us that I can be penetrated. Joy reminds us that I got something that is impenetrable. 
tears. Lord, I feel like preaching in here. Remind you and I that the pain I see in the world is still something that troubles my heart. And joy reminds me that I got a well of holy resources that can cause me to remain stable amidst all the instability, tears, and joy. And so the question for you and I today, what is it that is required for you and I to live in between and through the contours of tears and joy? First thing I believe the scripture says that is wonderful for us as a gift is that time is on our side. Somebody say time is on my side. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them time is on your side today. Amen. Now, now the scripture says in verse one, when the Lord restored. I almost just parked it when. Because how many of you know the when is the most exciting part of this verse because it denotes a sense of inevitability. It denotes that it will happen. It denotes that it may already be happening. It denotes that God is actively at work. Somebody holler when. And, and you see, what's great about this particular text, you know, we read the scriptures in the, Greek, in the English, but we don't fully appreciate that the original language is either Aramaic, Hebrew, or Greek. Which is just to say that we know by speaking the English language that there are many different ways to talk about time. But in the original languages, they have different words, so you don't get mixed up. About what kind of time we talking about? Somebody holler when. Well, today I'm going to use the Greek description of the word time. There are two kinds of time. There's chronos time. And that makes sense to some of us, all of us who have watches, who keep time. I think Malcolm X said never trust somebody who don't have a watch. Because mm -hmm. it means they don't know what time it is. Somebody say amen. And you ought to ask your neighbor, do you got a watch? Amen. It can be your phone, it can be something, but just make sure you know what time it is. That chronos, it is a quantitative time, which just means that just like the clock allows us to constantly be able to measure, to describe, to tell through seconds, minutes, hours, and years, time goes and cannot be retrieved. Once this time is gone, it cannot come back. Chronos time. Some of us live outside of Kronos time. And that's why it's a struggle for us to keep a job, somebody say amen, to get here on time for appointments, Sunday or otherwise. Man, I think the, the old African uh, quote says that we don't live in time, we live on time. No, we don't live on time, we live in time. Which is to say that time is on our side. Kronos, but then there is this notion of kairos. Kairos is not quantitative. You can't measure kairos. Kairos is qualitative, which means that it is about hmm, the right moment. It is about opportunities. It is about the perfect alignment of situations. It is about God doing something at a particular time that Kronos time can't account for. Anybody ever had a situation where you thought you were living on Kronos and God threw a little bit of curveball and you realize, man, I'm in some Kairos time. Whew. That thing should have wiped me out, but Kairos kept me alive. That door was closed, but Kairos opened up a new door. Uh-huh. Kairos is the kind of time that is always on our side. And when we are operating in Kairos time, how many of you know we are not a slave then to the time of this world? 
was just is to say that he may not come when you want him. But God is always on time. And I have found, beloved, that it's hard to trust God when I lose sight of Kairos time. <laughs> Amen. Because I can spend my whole life waiting in line on Kronos time. Well, I did. I did this amount of school. I saved this amount of money. I, I gave her this amount of flowers. I, I did. We ain't it supposed to add up to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, D. That's Kronos. And sometimes Kairos is the time that your destiny is operating in. And for many of us, our faith has to be cultivated through the tears and the joys to track God's time. Because God's time is never a slave to our time. I know there's some powerful people out here now. Chancellors, presidents, mayors, governors. But I want you to know that you, we are connected to a power greater than any power you can see with your natural eyes. I know there's a lot of post-religious folk out here, and I understand because it seems like why is, 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 is the, the act of evil and death so at work in the world, it has caused some folks to literally walk away from a sense of the divine. But I want to remind you, there's a win always at work in the now. That there is activity. Question, are you learning to trust God's win? 2023 is winding down. We are in the season of Advent on our way to Christmas. Some of us made some New Year's resolutions back in January. Then we revisit them back in June, July. And we're here in the second to last week of, 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 the, of 2023, and time is winding down, and you're feeling like, my goodness, time is, has, 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 has gotten away from you. I want you to know, beloved, are you learning to trust God's win? Humans make plans, but God is the one that brings them to fruition. It does not abdicate us of our responsibility to act, but it does mean when I act, God, I'm acting, praying on Kronos time, but willing to live in Kairos time. I'm praying in real time for war to end, but I know Kairos has some things going on. I'm praying in real time for my body to be healed, but Kairos has some things going on. I'm praying in real time for my children to be saved, but Kairos has some things going on. is that you and I must be willing to recycle our tears. Somebody say, recycle your tears. If you sow with tears, you will reap with songs of joy. If you go out weeping, you will return with songs of joy. Now, I got you right in a place here where this can feel like a cliche. Aren't you tired of church cliches? You know, I'm just like, God, I, my, life, my life is too complex for a church cliche. But this is not a church cliche. This is a divine formula. Tested over millennia. 
that the psalmist keeps reminding us of. That if you sow with tears, your tears are a seed for some joy. What possibly can your tears produce from the soil of pain, of death, of grief, of violence? Your tears can produce peace. Your tears can produce healing. Your tears can produce a new you. Because if the topography of tears that I threw up on the screen a few moments ago is indeed the case, I want you to know, beloved, that there is some unique terrain that your tears are exposing that God is actively at work in. So you must not let your tears go to waste. Let them flow. When your tears come down your cheeks, when they flow out your eyes, your tears are inviting you when they are psychic tears, tears related to grief and and pain. Your tears are sowing into a soil that will produce healing. I mean, I, I, I loved how, how, how in, in this thing, it, it, it says something so powerful that I haven't mentioned it yet, but it says that tears create an enzyme, a neurotransmitter that is a natural painkiller that is released within the body when you're under stress. Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost in here today. I want you to know, beloved, that I know that we're looking at the world and we're looking at the struggles. We're looking at our families and our communities and we feel like the only way for me to go through is to get harder. But I want you to know there's something about remaining tender enough where the tears that are produced from your humanity can flow so God can begin to release healing. I was with somebody and they were telling me in the New Guinea culture, that anything you create in the physical automatically gets transferred into the metaphysical. And I said, Lord, you better stop talking to me because I want you to know, child of God, that whenever I make a step towards the healing nature of God, I believe God begins to create the butterfly effect in the world. People are asking, why should we speak out against the violence in Palestine? Why should we speak out against the tragedies in Sudan? Why should we speak out against the genocide in Tigray? Don't you know we got problems in East Oakland? Don't you know we got problems in South Berkeley. Uh, Don't you know we got problems in Hunter's Point? Uh, Why are you concerned about everything that's happening over there? Uh, I said because the same tears I cry uh, under the guise of the Holy Ghost uh, have no geographic limitation. Uh, I believe uh, that God is hearing and seeing the tears uh, that we cry in America uh, and he's linking it up with the tears uh, that are being cried in Africa, that are being cried in Latin America, that are being cried in Europe, and I believe that healing is being released when the people of God begin to cry. My heart breaks for the things that break God's heart. What kind of Christian have we become where we know God weeps at the destruction in the world, but we don't have the capacity to have enough tenderness, to have tears in the midst of all this challenge. It's because we think that tears are a sign of weakness, but I came to tell somebody that Jesus wept. He wept when he got sad. He wept when he got tired. He wept when he looked on Jerusalem. And his weeping did not paralyze him, but it made him push forward. He said, my mind, my will, my God is set to Jerusalem. I must go. I must go and do the will of God. Don't you dare, beloved, let a misformed, uninformed, false and lying, no 
notion of masculinity <laughs> rob you of the healing power <laughs> of your tears. <laughs> you better cry <laughs> when your heart gets broken. <laughs> you better cry <laughs> when your mind gets troubled. <laughs> you better cry <laughs> when you get angry. <laughs> because in my crying, <laughs> God will <laughs> heal my inner being. Oh, Lord, I preached a little too early, but the last thing I'm going to say is don't stop asking. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him don't stop asking God. Don't stop asking God to restore your fortunes. This is what the text says. Restore our fortunes. Oh, God, like you did it in the Najab Desert. Can I tell you what Negev is? Negev is the largest desert in the region of Palestine, Israel. In this desert, you had biblical figures like Abraham, Moses, David, Elijah, and John the Baptist. While they were in a desert, they didn't appear to be any water, but every one of them had a testimony uh, that while I was in the desert, uh, God, you produced water uh, in the middle of my desert place. Uh, while I was in the desert, uh, you produced food uh, so I could have something to eat. Uh, while I was in the desert place, uh, you healed me uh, so I could come out better than when I went in. Uh, I came to tell you uh, that you got in the death. Uh, there is a place that God is saying mark this place because in this place there's healing waiting on you there's water waiting on you there's power waiting on you there's anointing waiting on you mark the place and don't stop asking I need peace I need joy I need hope I need power and I Today, somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, stand with me, everybody. Don't stop asking for what you need. Tears and joy. Joy and tears. You may be living in between it, but I want you to know that is where miracles happen. What is a miracle? A miracle ain't nothing but something that God did. Drake tried to make a song, said God's plan. Was it Drake or was it uh, Cali? One of them. They trying to, they trying to translate a divine principle in very simplified ways. I'm not no hater, but I just want you to know, God's plan is a miracle. Whenever God inhabits our tears and our joys, we begin to see a miracle. And that's what we need in some of these moments of our lives. We need a miracle. We need God to do something that only God can do. If I could do it, it'd be done. That's probably part of the problem. Because I've tried to do it. And it got all messed up. But do I have a witness in here that believes that God can do something we can't do? Grab the hand of someone. I just feel the need to pray first for the person we're touching. Oh God, my brother, my sister, my sibling, my loved one, they're living in between the tears and the joy. 
the season has brought things up for them that they'd rather not deal with. Life has presented them with things they'd rather not confront. Relationships have brought to the surface pains and challenges they'd rather forget. World events have reminded us of how far-reaching our civic responsibilities go. We are human beings created in your image, which is just to say that we do have limitations. We have boundaries. We have breaking points. Thank you that you've created us with the miracle of physiological healing through the tears we cry through the pains we feel you have given our bodies the capacity to start the healing process but have given us the will to finish it so as the tears flow down our faces today God we say yes to the healing process that is needed in all of our lives. We say thank you that our hearts are not hardened towards the genocides happening in other parts of the world. Thank you that our hearts are not so hardened that the tragedies of our own communities are lost upon us. Thank you, God, that our hearts are not so hard that I can't feel the pain of my loved one who I'm touching. We stand together in unity today saying, heal my neighbor. Let their tears, God, be in exchange for joy. Peace, hope, love, and power. Do it in the name of Jesus. Do it in the name of Jesus. And so we lift our hands to you today, God. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, my sister or my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. I need you, God, to give peace to my heart. Peace to my community. Peace to the world. Peace in the Middle East. Peace in Africa. Peace in Ukraine. Peace in Brazil, peace in Haiti, peace in Nicaragua, peace in Mexico, peace God in Venezuela, peace in the world, peace in the United States, peace in East Oakland, peace in Richmond, peace in Berkeley, peace in San Francisco, peace in Fresno, peace in Stockton, Sacramento, give us peace in San Jose, peace in the region, somebody holler peace. Send us, God, what we need to be agents of your peace today because we know that we in this season are called to be expressions of your coming. In Jesus' name.